Thank you very much. I, I tend to talk too fast. My mother will tell you that. It's because in my household, if you stop to breathe, you lost your turn. So I'll do my best to keep it at a conversational pace. A lot of material to cover. I'll be here at the break after the next two speakers, and I'll be here at 3 o'clock if you want to fight traffic and have got another question you'd like to ask me before you leave. Most people will tell you, most people who coach TEDx will tell you things you should do to get a TEDx talk. We are going to cover the six things you can do to kill your chances of landing a TEDx talk. And here's why. Because the average TEDx talk gets 100, 200, 300 applications. And if I'm on the team who has to select 36 or 48 auditioners, I am not looking for the first reason to book you for an audition. I'm looking for the first reason that I can find to not book you and throw you in what they call the no pile. Because I've got another couple hundred applications to go through. Here's a bonus tip, seven, and I'll give it to you first. On a TEDx application, follow the instructions to the letter. They put traps in there in the form of give us a 60 second video. Do not give them a 61 second or 62 second. One of my clients gave them a 68 second video, dismissed out of hand. And, and he lived within driving distance of this TEDx. It broke my heart because I've never done one. I didn't have to fly to. As Henry said, TEDx is a credibility stage. I have 10 TEDx talks in the can. I've got another one, number 11, coming up in October. People ask me, did you get a booking from a TEDx talk? No. Have not. I can't draw a straight line from a TEDx to a booking. However, in the form of credibility, marketability, visibility, it's all in how you leverage the TEDx once you have it. You know, it should be the thumbnail on your website should have the big red letters behind you. Your sizzle reel should be chock full of pieces of your TEDx. So again, it is a great marketing tool, another arrow in your marketing quiver. <clears throat> but I can't, I can't say I've ever booked. Now, at the bottom of my Gmail, there are four TEDx talks lined up, credibility. So if a speaker bureau sent out three speakers on my topic, which you might have guessed is suicide prevention, it, maybe I get a leg up because I've got TEDx talks and they don't. So uh, the number one killer of TEDx applications is too much, too many ideas. TEDx, I'm guessing you know this, is an idea worth spreading. And one, yes, numero uno, one. One idea worth spreading. TEDx, kill your TEDx tip number two is a cousin of number one. Too much about one idea. They don't want a thesis. No. And you'll notice on the applications, by the way, that they'll say something like, give us a two to three sentence summary. Give us a two to three paragraph summary. Give us a title of subtitle. Give us a 10 to 15 word elevator pitch. We filled out one the other day with one of my clients for Boulder, TEDx Boulder. Give us your idea in seven words. Yes, there's a lot of editing that goes on when you're filling out a TEDx application and doing a TEDx talk. The average TEDx talk nowadays, you have up to 18 minutes, according to Big Ted. <clears throat> Big Ted, X by the way means local. There's one TED event every year in Vancouver, BC, three to seven days, Steve Jobs, Al Gore, uh, Bill Gates. But around the country and around the world, X means local, 200 plus in the US, 3,000 worldwide. So do not give them more than they want because, you know, again, they gotta go through a couple hundred applications. That's why they wanna keep it short. And they figure if you can sum up your idea in seven words, you can do it in 18 minutes. And nowadays, and I just saw this yesterday, they're pushing people who run TEDx events to hold the speakers to 12 minutes. The one I did last Sunday, 10 minutes. The one I'm doing in October, nine minutes. They want short speech, high impact. So that's, I think, why they have you, you know, seven word idea worth spreading. Let's see, number three. <clears throat> Number three mistake is um, lacks creativity. I was a writer for, for The Tonight Show for 20 years, been a stand-up comic full-time for 37, and creativity is my thing. Uh, I believe that if there are a couple hundred applications, whatever you put in those first couple of boxes better grab their attention. That's the hook. 
Because if, does, if I'm looking at those apps and you don't grab my attention with the title and subtitle or elevator pitch or whatever, I'm going on to the next one. I figured this out when I did my fourth TEDx. It's called Dead Man, let's see, no. Suicide, the secret of my success, it's counterintuitive, Dead Man Talking, which is a play on the movie and book Dead Man Walking. They call me. You don't usually get a phone call, you get an email. Call me. Frank, this is a TEDx Pensacola. I said, did I get an audition? They said, no, you don't have to audition. We love the title and subtitle and idea so much, you're on. That told me that that is the first hurdle to get over. Be as creative as possible. My fifth one, my personal favorite, also didn't have to audition for, you're about to see why. Got a phone call. It's called Mental Health and the Orgasm. <laughs> Treat your depression single-handedly. <laughs> the only one I've ever gotten a standing ovation for. I closed it with a joke my wife said not to do. I said, it's going to kill. After all this business about orgasm and so forth and all the healthful, you know, physical and mental healthful things that happen with that, besides the obvious. I said, do you guys know why they call an orgasm an orgasm? And they're like, no. I said, because nobody gets spell. <laughs> Standing ovation. <laughs> so number three is lacks creativity. And of all the TEDx coaching outfits in the country, and there are a number and much larger than my little operation, I don't think they've got anybody on staff that creative. I believe the title should be something that we know the meaning of the English words, but we don't really know what they're getting at which forces them to read the subtitle, which explains the idea. And maybe if they get that far, maybe they'll read, you know, the summary. And then why, why you are the person to deliver it. That's usually the next question. Why are you the person? The next question is generally, why this idea and why now? So what I do with my clients is, A, I find the application links for them because Ted doesn't make it easy. B, <clears throat> we create a document with the answers to the most frequently asked questions on those apps because they repeat. Title, subtitle, elevator pitch, two to three sentence summary, two to three paragraph summary. Why are you the person? Why now? Why this idea? So we can just cut and paste, cut and paste. We, most of my clients and I get together for an hour a week, send out one or two applications. And the average, by the way, is 86 applications before you get your TEDx. I've only got one client and he's now at 87. Uh, most of my clients in a couple, three dozen applications get a TEDx, if they come two or three times a month and do two or three hours with me a month and we fill out two to four to five applications a month, 90% of my clients who've done that have gotten a TEDx. So mistake number three is lacks creativity. <laughs> mistake number four, oh, hiring the wrong TEDx coach. I'm not saying hire me, just be very careful who you hire and ask them who, you know, how do you guys handle the creative? Who on your staff is creative? Who fills out the applications? Because again, I think that's the linchpin is otherwise no pile, no pile. You, it's a hook. You know what it really is? It's a marketing pitch to the selection committee, strictly marketing. I've had to break it to my speaker coaching clients. I coach make money speaking. I go, look, here's the deal. I'm not a speaker. I'm a sales and marketing guy who speaks. I spend 85% of my time sales and marketing, 5% traveling, 5% writing, 5% performing. The job is not here. This is the fun part. The job is getting here. Yeah, so if you're not into sales, if sales is a problem for you, you need to pick another career. So, <clears throat> but say, I would say, be careful. And what I would do is, I would ask them for a recommendation or two, you know, co contact information on two speakers they work with in your price range, your fee range, and as to how they liked or did not like the coaching. And the, the biggest coaching company, I will not say their name, I don't want to besmirch them, but I got a client from them simply because when she asked, I need a couple of references, the sales guy said, we don't, we don't give out references. Because you know what, people actually follow up and they, and they contact them. <laughs> and it irritates them. They would not give references. How do you, I, I just, uh, yeah. So anyway, 
I'm not going to say who it is. They're the biggest ones, and they, they do very well, and they, they, get people, they get people TEDx's. I mean, probably hundreds of people, but I, I'm not, that's just not my style. Number five, oh, lack of passion for your topic. It's hard to be inspiring if you are not inspired. You probably notice I'm wearing a shirt that says the word suicide blazoned. I speak on suicide prevention as a workplace health and safety priority. That's my lane. A great thing about a TEDx is it forces you to pick one idea. And I tell my speaker coaching clients, that forces you to pick a speaker lane, a speaking lane. I believe you should have one lane and become a thought leader or expert. Otherwise, you're a commodity in the speaking business. If you're a generalist and speak on two or three things and you advertise that, then it's going to be difficult to get booked because meeting planners nowadays, it seems to me, like the expert or thought leader. Don't throw away the other items because when the meeting planner pushes back on me for my $7,500 fee, that's a lot of money for 45 minutes. Well, you got me for the entire day. I'll do a keynote in the morning. I'll do a workshop on men's mental health in the afternoon. I'll, 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 you know, I'll do comedy at the banquet that night. Hell, I'll acid wash the pool at the hotel. I don't care. I'm yours all day. So make sure you have those other, I always recommend at least a second offering to use rather than lower your fee, give more value. So pick the right company. Oh, passion for your topic. <clears throat> I'm passionate about my topic because Depression and suicide run in my family. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. I screamed for days. And I came close enough to killing myself in 2010 after a Chapter 7 bankruptcy that I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. Spoiler alert, I didn't pull the trigger. Yeah, that's in my keynote. Um, and I tell the audience, a friend of mine came up after a keynote. And he goes, hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? <laughs> I said, hey, man, could you try to sound slightly less disappointed? <laughs> That's where the humor is in that topic. No, it's not a joking topic, but there are funny personal anecdotes. A meeting planner called me. I said, I'm doing a keynote. She goes, great. I said, what do you want me to cover? She knows I put a gun in my mouth. She goes, just give me a couple of bullet points. <laughs> I let that hang in the air. And all of a sudden, she's going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Relax, Michelle. I just couldn't let it go by. Yeah. So it runs in my family. There are more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd. And I have the personal lived experience. And, and my goal in life is to save a life a day. That's my goal. When I speak, uh, I save lives. I mean, I, I, I've had people contact me afterward. I mean, I've, hopefully you've impacted people that you will never hear from. Hopefully there are a lot of people that I helped that... I have a condition called chronic suicidal ideation. Chronic suicidal ideation. It means for me and people like me, suicide's always on the menu as an option, as a solution, problems large and small. And I tell that story. For example, my car broke down a couple of years ago. I had three thoughts, get it fixed, buy a new one, kill myself. I tell that story. And every time, almost every time, since 2014 I've spoken, there's been one person in the audience who has that condition. And invariably, they don't know it has a name, they think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. A woman came up to me after a college presentation. Thanks for the keynote. I said, you're welcome. She goes, but I gotta tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? She goes, you know your story about the car? Get it fixed, buy a new one, kill yourself, yeah? She goes, I've been having those thoughts all my life. I didn't know that had a name. I thought I was some kind of freak and completely alone. And when I heard you say that you have that, I realized for the first time in my life, I'm not alone, and I wept. That's the ROI. That's the passion you need to have. Somebody said to me on a clubhouse stage, you know, the, the audio clubhouse, the topic was, how do you get confident on stage? I said, you stand in your truth and you will be confident on stage. I had a guy come up to me after a speech, a psychologist. <clears throat> he said to me, what qualifies you to speak on suicide prevention? I said, well, I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. And in the silence that followed, I said, I can go to college. I can learn everything you know. You will never know everything I know. That's the kind of passion you need, I believe. And Ted is all about passion. Be passionate about your, about your topic. Uh, the last one, number six, is 
not enough applications. I have a number of clients who came to me, yeah, I tried two or three times and I, you know, I, I think we should apply once or twice a week, you know, until you get one. It's a bit of a numbers game. You need, you hit the right theme at the right time with the right idea. And, you know, then, so it's, again, 90% of my clients who come a couple, three times a month and we fill out four to six applications, get a TEDx. And then I help them, I help them with the audition because they almost always ask the same questions in the audition. Um, They'll ask you, great idea. What are the learning objectives? So make sure you have those listed. What are the action items? So three to five learning objectives, one to three action items. They'll ask you about your research. They, got, they really cracked down on pseudoscience, junk science. <clears throat> so you gotta be very careful. You gotta have resource. It's like, it's like a term paper, footnotes, citations, references. You gotta have all that in a separate document. Because once you do it, Big Ted may ask for the same list. And they can post it, they can post it with an editorial note, or they can refuse to post it. I myself, I haven't had anything posted since my fourth TEDx talk. Because when I hit five, they don't like that. They don't like somebody to do that many. They've Actually this year, they've come over the rule. If you do four, great. You do five, we may post that the next year, we may not. I think of it as the Frank King rule. <laughs> Because, yeah, they don't like me because I'm like a, a blackjack player in Vegas who's figured out how to card count and I've gamed the system and it's pissing them off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know Chris Anderson who owns Ted knows exactly who I am. I, I, I'm tempted to email him, hey, Chris, <laughs> yeah, yeah, why don't you post my stuff? And here's the irony, I think. Ted will tell you it's about the idea, not the person. Okay. So if my idea saved lives, because each of my mental health talks is a different aspect of mental health, mental illness, suicide. If my TEDx's have the potential to save lives, why not, post why not post them? If it's not the person, it's the idea. But I think Chris is taking it personally, <laughs> which is fine. That's fine. Um, so anyway, that's the um, that's six, and I gave you seven was make sure that you're very careful when you fill out the app. Mental health and the orgasm, I labeled the video wrong. They have a very specific way they wanted the video labeled, but they liked the idea so much, they called and gave me a mulligan. They said, look, we're not gonna tell anybody, send that video again and make sure you label it correctly, okay? <laughs> and I got it. So, but be very careful. That's the way they disqualify people is by, you don't follow directions. And the, I understand because if you have 14 speakers and some of them can't follow directions. It's going to be like herding cats when the event arrives. So the last one I did in San Diego, Taft Avenue, TEDx Taft Avenue, 14 speakers. Everyone kept to their time, 10 minutes on the dot, because the organizer had those disqualifiers, eliminated people who couldn't follow directions, and was very specific. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And it, it actually finished early, which is unusual for a speaking event with 14 speakers. So I'll hang out after the, after the next two speakers for the break, and then I'll hang out a little after three o'clock if you have a question. We have an amazing speaker coming up after me. Smart, full of good advice. Come on up, Henry. Let's give it up for Frank, too.